He is a citizen of Canada and France. He is a descendant of three former Quebec premiers, and he's one of ten siblings. To help us understand, NDP leader Thomas Mulcair, the person we're joined in the nation's capital by, John Geddes, Ottawa Bureau Chief at McLean's. And we welcome you, John, back to our broadcast. And just before we start talking about the leader of Her Majesty's official opposition, let's, if we could, Sheldon, bring some information up about him. He was born on the 24th of October, 1954, spent his early years in Gatineau, Quebec. His family later moved to Montreal when Mulcair was a preschooler. He is the second oldest of 10 siblings. His father, Harry, was Irish Catholic. His mother, Jeanne, was French Canadian. And he was accepted into McGill Law at the age of 18. Let's see, John, if we can understand this man better. As, um, as the second oldest of 10, can you talk to us about why that may or may not have been significant during his formative years? Well, he sure thinks it's significant, and so do all his friends. It's a f almost always the first thing that people who know him well bring up about him. And there's a few things about that. I spoke with his, his younger sister a few years ago, and she said that one thing that was a, a factor in their household growing up is that their parents relied on the oldest siblings, including Tom, to sort of take care of the younger ones. So they all have memories of Tom, you know, reading stories to them at bedtime, helping them with schoolwork, and, and even later on giving them life advice as they were getting going. So he's a guy who I think took on a lot of that type of responsibility really early, earlier than we I think would typically think of kids doing today, or, or of kids doing in, in the, the smaller families that are more, more the norm these days. As a person who grew up in Quebec at a certain time, one assumes that religion had an important part in his life, did it? it sure did. He, he, uh, he was in a devout Catholic household. He remembers going to Mass before school on weekdays when he was a kid. And maybe even more important than that, there's a, a sort of a direct linkage between the religious life of the family and the sort of early political life of Tom Mulcair. He had a, a mentor in high school, uh, Father Alan Cox, who got kids interested in sort of left Catholic progressive activities, you know, going to help people in the poorer parts of Montreal, that sort of thing. So, so there's, a, there's a sort of a, 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 an easy transition, I think, in, in his own, in Mr. Mulcair's own memories of his childhood between, you know, what was religious life and what was political life. He thinks of them as having been bound together. Bound together, okay, but usually in every politician's life there's that moment where the light bulb goes on and they say, aha, I'm going into politics. Did he have that kind of yeah. aha moment? He says he did. He was 14. Uh, he's told me in an interview, I think he's mentioned it elsewhere. Uh, when I asked him a why at 14, the explanation he gave was quite interesting. He said in their busy household with all those kids around the table, one way that you got to be part of the adult conversation was by talking politics. Uh, his parents both came from liberal families, had liberal backgrounds. You mentioned in your intro, on his mother's side, he's, he's descended from prominent liberals in Quebec, uh, liberal premiers. So politics was being talked about, and as a kid, he found, you know, you we're thinking about here a kid who was sort of in a hurry to grow up, a way that he could be heard in the adult conversations by talking politics. And, you know, he thinks that partly as a result of that, he thought, hey, this is something I'd like to do. So at 14, he starts saying he wants to be a politician. Hmm. In a hurry to grow up and having sort of parental responsibilities because of the number of kids that were in that family, do you, do you look at those facts and say this guy, as a result, may have bypassed a, a normal childhood? Yeah. Y you know, nobody who knows Mulcair well says he's a you know, he's a barrel of laughs, right? <laughs> the tendency is for people to say that he's intense, he's a fighter, he's serious, he studies, and, and it's all of a piece, right? This is a guy who, you know, takes on responsibilities early, comes, has serious aspirations and ambitions early, and again, I think it was mentioned in your introduction, he goes into McGill Law School, serious, serious law school, at 18, very rare at any time and rare in his day as well. So, yeah, everything seems a bit accelerated with him, and, and you know, normal childhood fun and games probably don't play that big a part. Well, let's continue on that angle because he gets married at 21 and, uh, and is still married to the same woman that he fell in love with all those years later. Tell us about her. Mm. I wish, Steve, I could tell you more about her. She's, she's, uh, she's uh, French from France. She's from Paris. She was in uh, Quebec for uh, the uh, wedding of a family friend when she and Mulcair met when they were teenagers. Uh, she's a psychologist. Uh, interesting character in the sense that uh, she's obviously a serious uh, person with a serious career. Mulcair leans on her heavily, I think, in, in private. But I wouldn't say she's had a really 
large public profile so far. I've really only met her once. Uh, she sat in on an interview I did with Mulcair a few years ago, and I, I wouldn't want to stretch the, the bounds of what I really know about her. I do know that when I, I was interviewing Mulcair, and there was, a, there was a moment, Steve, where he looked like he was going to get angry with me. He was a little annoyed that I was making, asking a critical question about his, his speaking style, his, his public speaking style. And at that moment, she reached over and put her hand on his hand in a kind of, okay, calm down kind of gesture. And I, I found that sort of telling of a kind of intimacy between them, but I, I can't pretend that I know a lot about her. Well, uh, admittedly, uh, I don't know much about her either, although she is out on the hustings with him more now than I've ever seen her before. Her name is Catherine, incidentally. Yeah. And, and I guess he describes, in reading Mulcair's autobiography, he describes her as the one who really improved his French, particularly when he gave speeches, because, of course, yeah. it was, it was uh, her first language. Uh, you know, very, do you see that through the years? Point. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the point where he mentioned that to me was when he, he graduates McGill and goes to work in the Justice Department in the Quebec government, this is a very French-speaking environment and actually a very separatist environment at that time. Mulcair, although he, he's bilingual, he's had all his schooling in English and his household language was, you know, he spoke some French, but it was mostly English. So he has to ramp up his French very quickly and he talks about an intense period of his, his new wife tutoring him at home and even going over his paperwork from the office and correcting his French and he says that was a, a huge leap forward for him in terms of feeling comfortable in public life in Quebec was that he mastered French at that stage and she's instrumental in that. Hmm. Let's talk about a former Quebec leader that uh, people who've been around for a long time uh, may remember from the first referendum battle in the 1980s. This was the leader of the Quebec Liberal Party uh, 35 years ago, Claude Ryan, who is apparently a very significant hmm. influence in Mr. Mulcair's life as well. How so? Well, he, uh, Mulcair came in contact with him through that, that period in the late 70s and early 80s when he was establishing himself as a, as a sort of public administrator. Uh, Mulcair had a couple of roles during that period in Quebec. Ryan uh, mentored him through, the, through those years. And there are several things I think are really interesting about this uh, that I could, you know, we could sort of sketch. One is that um, asked what he liked about Ryan, Mulcair will say he liked the fact that he had a fighting Irish streak, which Mulcair likes to see in himself, but also what he thinks of as a good Catholic social conscience, two things, again, that Mulcair values highly. He also mentions repeatedly how uh, Ryan instilled in him the value of very competent, very rigorous public administration. Now, this isn't something you hear a lot from politicians these days, Steve. People like to be more populist than that. Mulcair doesn't mind doing this, still does it on the hustings today, where he'll talk about, well, what, what I want to bring is you know, good administration, sound administration. It's not exactly a rallying cry, but I think it's something he's internalized and then he, he attributes that directly to Ryan. Ryan told him, run a meeting properly, look at all the options, bring the experts to the table, assess how the regulations are supposed to be implied. Not sexy stuff, but I think it's deeply ingrained in Mulcair's way of thinking about politics and, and especially about thinking about government. Hmm. One of the things people in Ontario may not know about Tom Mulcair was that uh, well, I guess it's more than 20 years ago now. He was first elected as a member of the National Assembly in Quebec provincial politics as a liberal uh, MNA and went on to become uh, environment minister in the government of Jean Charest. Can you tell how good an environment minister he was? Uh, you know, how good is an interesting assessment, but I can say this, Steve. He was, he was certainly passionate about that portfolio. He, he, he's proud of what he did. And it was his passion for particular elements of the portfolio that led to his rupture with, with Charest. So the, the, the sort of straw that broke the camel's back there was Charest wanted to allow some condo development in a provincial park and Mulcair wouldn't have it. There were other factors, but that was, the, that was the end game for those two guys. So at the very least, we can say he was willing to have it derail his provincial political career. He felt strongly enough about you know, the, 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 the principles he was trying to apply in the portfolio to let that be you know, a, 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 game, a deal breaker for, between he and Charest. So I think I leave it to people who covered Quebec City in those days to say whether he was a really good environment minister, but I think it's fair to say he was very passionate about the job. He certainly, when he's out on the hustings today, boasts about some of the accomplishments that he feels he had in that portfolio. But also, in yeah. his autobiographer, he, he really does offer a very G-rated version of the split that he had with Charest. I'm told that uh, Charest doesn't hate very many people in this world, but that Mulcair is one of them. Uh, why was this yeah. split so bitter? Uh, well, there are a number of factors. I mean, uh, Mulcair himself thinks there's a deep ideological reason for it. If you think about it, 
Uh, Mulcair is sort of a, a left Catholic from early days. Um, Jean Charest is a is a is a is a blue. He's a, he's a conservative, right? Comes out of the conservative wing. In Quebec politics, the Liberal Party was a w was a catch basin for both sides as long as you were a Federalist. So strange ideological bedfellows would come together there. They didn't see eye to eye on that kind of thing. There's also a matter of temperament. If you think about it, uh, Mulcair is a very intense, rigorous uh, fighter. Charest is a kind of genial. Um, politician who built his career on his ability to foster relationships and to present a kind of upbeat public face on politics, right? One of the best uh, campaigners in that light that I've ever seen, sort of lights up a room, Charest. Mulcair is, is, a, is a darker, more intense personality. So you've got you know, two guys who come from different ideological, ideological backgrounds, who have a different way of thinking about politics, and who are both guys who probably want to be the boss when it comes right down to it. And as everybody knows, there's really only one boss in a government or a political party. Mm -hmm. Well, I, we're going to need you to fill in some of the blanks on this next thing, because you referred to Mr. Mulcair's personality. You know, the, his opponents have really tried hard to brand him as quote unquote, angry Tom. And I, right. I wonder how much of that is their efforts to kind of, uh, you know, destroy him, and how much of that is really there? Uh, uh, you know, angry is not the word that comes to mind, I think, for people who've watched him in his years in Ottawa. Intense, combative, pugnacious. But anger, when I hear the word angry, I think more of someone who's, who's losing control a bit. And Mulcair is nothing if not controlled. You know, he's a guy who has his lines carefully prepared. They're concise, brisk lines. When he's directing his ire at something, it really seems focused. It doesn't seem like it's a shotgun of, of outrage. It's more like a focused, intense kind of penetrating uh, objection that he'll raise. So, you know, the, the idea of him, if people say angry and they mean he's a guy who lacks discipline in the way he lets his emotions carry into his politics, I don't think that's accurate. If they mean angry in the sense that he gets pretty heated about some of the things that he's thinking about, uh, yeah, I think that's probably true. He, and that includes his critiques of people in his own party. In his early days in the NDP under Jack Layton, he was angry, for example, about what he viewed as poor French in NDP materials and what he sometimes called a kind of boilerplate left-wing uh, stance that the party took on some stuff. He, seemed, he would seem quite annoyed about that stuff. But angry, maybe, but not angry in the way that you think of when you think of someone who loses control. Hmm. John, it may be a double standard, but, but I, I, I suspect in English Canada, if you are a, a person of significance in politics and you come from Quebec, there may be a sense that, okay, you, you know Quebec well, but how well do you really know the rest of the country? And I wonder, let's put that test to Mr. Mulcair. He obviously uh, you know, knows Quebec extremely well. He's got the largest number of seats of any party in Quebec uh, and is expected mm -hmm. to as well on Election Day in October. How well does he know the rest of Canada? Uh, how, I, you, there probably is a bit of a double standard there, right? I mean, we, people know the place they're from best. He doesn't know the rest of Canada as well as he knows Quebec. He still uh, refers to Quebec experiences regularly when he talks policy. You've mentioned already with respect to environmental policy, he'll allude to it. With respect to childcare policy, a pillar of the NDP platform this campaign, he often alludes to the Quebec model. So his frame of reference is, is, is definitely Quebec. Uh, I think it would be almost uh, self-evident that he doesn't know the other parts of the country as well. On the other hand, he has traveled a lot and campaigned a lot. You know, back when he was running against Brian Toff for the NDP leadership, he campaigned every single day in a long campaign, never took a day off as far as I can tell, including over the Christmas holiday. And a lot of that time was spent going out and trying to, to get himself known in places where, where he wasn't a familiar face. So he certainly has worked at getting to know the rest of the country. I guess voters are gonna have to decide, and I think this is part of the test he has to meet by October 19th, whether he really knows them well enough, and, and I guess the flip side of that is whether they've grown to know him well enough. Well, let's finish up on this, because I'm not sure I've ever heard a political leader from Montreal come to Toronto and say, on multiple occasions, Toronto was the most important city in this country. Uh, yes. I, I, I'm sure people in Toronto appreciate hearing that, but I wonder if that costs him anything back home, where I'm not sure Montrealers like hearing that. 
he is, he is many points ahead in the opinion polls in, one, in Quebec. I think he can afford to lose a, point, a few points there. He's behind in Ontario, uh, so I think he desperately needs to gain a few points in, in your province and my province. The, uh, so I think that's part of that thing. And the other thing is, you know, Toronto is the most important city in the country by most objective standards. And Mul Mulcair does bring a kind, of, uh, a kind of rigor to the way he analyzes things. And in a way, I think it kind of probably pleases him and reflects something of his own self-image that he thinks he calls it as he sees it. And, uh, you know, so in this case, probably that you know, works for him both ways. Good politics and something he can think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm telling it like it is. That's John Gaddis, McLean's Magazine, out of the nation's capital. John, it's always good to have you on TVO. Thanks so much for this. Thanks, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.